Welcome to the Storyteller's Thread, a monthly podcast devoted to young adult literature and the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Sean Connors. On each episode, we invite an author for young adults to take us inside their work, and in doing so, to talk about their writing process, their inspiration for writing for young readers, and the general ins and outs of earning a living as a professional storyteller. So, whether you're a compulsive reader, an aspiring writer, a teacher or librarian, or simply a frustrated reader who's counting the hours until you get home and dive back into that novel that's waiting for you on your nightstand. This is the place for you. Hello everyone, it's January 1st, 2019, and I'm your host, Sean Connors. 2019, are you kidding me? Where has the time gone? This month on the Storyteller's Thread podcast, we're ringing in the new year by talking with the award-winning author of books for children and young adults, Matt De La Pena. If you follow me over on Twitter, then you know I've been busy the past few days promoting this podcast and promising people like yourself that you're in for some real treats in 2019. So I'm keeping my word and we are setting the bar high, people. What better way to kick off the new year than by talking with a Newbery award-winning writer? If you've read Matt's books or you've heard him speak, then you already know that he's an incredibly talented writer. But beyond that, he's just an amazingly genuine and generous person. For all of his accolades and success, he's managed to remain kind and humble, and I want to thank him for taking time out of his holiday to talk with me about his work. So Matt, if you're listening, a big shout out and thank you. If you aren't familiar with Matt's work, then do yourself a favor and rectify that immediately by reading his books. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Speaking of the holidays, I hope that you manage to enjoy some time off from work or school or whatever it is you do. For my part, I've been reading voraciously, and I feel compelled to plug Douglas Preston's nonfiction book, The Lost City of the Monkey King. The book is incredibly readable, and it offers an insider's account of a 2012 expedition to find the fabled White City, an ancient civilization that was rumored to have existed hundreds of years ago in the rainforest of Honduras. The book is engaging from the get-go, and it offers some really fascinating insights into the history of Central America and the early peoples that inhabited it. So if you enjoy adventure stories, or if you know someone who does, then Preston's book is definitely worth your time, I promise you. Before we dive into our conversation with Matt, let me just say that if you enjoy this month's episode of the Storyteller's Thread podcast and have something positive that you can say about it, I'd appreciate you taking a second out of your life to rate it over on iTunes. It'll cost you a click of your mouse or a tap of your screen, but you'll help me to raise the show's profile. Thanks, as always, for listening to this podcast, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Matt. Born in National City, California, not far from the U.S.-Mexico border, author Matt De La Pena was raised in a Mexican-American family. A self-described reluctant reader and mediocre student in junior high school and high school, De La Pena excelled on the basketball court, eventually earning a scholarship to play basketball at University of the Pacific. It was there that an English professor introduced him to Alice Walker's The Color Purple, sparking his interest in reading and setting him on a course that would result in his becoming an award-winning author of literary books for children and young adults. After graduating from University of the Pacific with a Bachelor of Arts degree, De La Pena earned a Master of Fine Arts from San Diego State University, where he studied creative writing. Although the program focused on literature for adults, his first book, Ball Don't Lie, was published as a young adult novel in 2005. In writing Mexican White Boy, which was published in 2008, and We Were Here, published just one year later, De La Pena drew for inspiration on his own experiences growing up in a mixed-race family. Like the characters in his books, he recalls having felt like he wasn't Mexican enough when he visited his father's family, while also perceiving a difference between himself and his white classmates. 
Delapena's struggles with his racial identity finds its expression in characters like Danny Lopez, the biracial narrator of Mexican White Boy, who describes himself as a white boy among Mexicans and a Mexican among white boys. In 2015, Delapena published his first picture book, The Last Stop on Market Street. The following year, the book won the Newbery Award, which acknowledges distinguished contributions made by authors to American children's literature. Not only was it the first time that a picture book won the coveted award, but De La Pena also became the first Hispanic writer to receive the Newbery. Since then, he has published three additional picture books, Miguel and the Grand Harmony, Carmela Full of Wishes, and most recently, the critically acclaimed Love. In an essay that he wrote for National Public Radio, De La Pena explained his objectives as a writer as follows. When I write my own novels, I try to craft the best possible stories, and I certainly aim to be entertaining, but I'm also conscious of the powerful function literature can serve, especially in the lives of kids growing up the way I did. My goal as a writer is to proceed into the background, allowing readers to fully participate. I want them to be able to watch the characters and listen to conversations and be free to form judgments of their own. I believe it's in this space that young readers acquire experience with complex emotions like empathy and sensitivity, which makes them more likely to be in tune with emotional nuance out in the real world. When you accepted the 2016 Newbery Award for your picture book, The Last Stop on Market Street, you began your speech by quoting the final line of Dennis Johnson's short story collection, Jesus' Son. Yes. I had never known, never even imagined for a heartbeat, that there might be a place for people like us. Can you talk about the significance of that line for you, both personally and professionally? Yeah, so there are two reasons that I think of that line. First of all, I didn't grow up in the world of books. I wasn't um, somebody who navigated my early childhood through reading or being read to. So, you know, I just didn't think the world of books was a place for me. I didn't think I had a place in it. I always felt like it was a club that I didn't belong to. But I think it goes beyond just books. It was kind of I never saw myself as, you know, a scholar, an achiever, you know, where I come from and the family I was in. We just sort of like moved through life and you didn't expect big things. You you just sort of kept your head down, did work and um, carved out a tiny life, which, by the way, a tiny life can be beautiful. And maybe that's what I'm still doing. But. I think when I got into college, my my focus shifted and I started to understand the power of literature and the power of learning. And that's when I started to think, well, maybe there is a slight place for me in the world of books. Now, on a professional level, you know, the one thing I'll say about me in the world of books is I just, I feel like... Um, Sometimes athletes say this um, about their careers, but sometimes I feel like I wasn't supposed to be here. I was never supposed to sell a book. You know, I used to wrote, write these spoken word poems that I shared with nobody, and I just never expected to be in the world of, of books as a writer. So I think that line that started the Newberry speech, it was twofold. It was I'm shocked that I that I have a life in literature and and I'm living, uh, you know, like a literate life. But the the second thing is, I just never thought I would have a career as a writer, and it it just was so confusing to me. Because even after you publish one book or two or three, you know, I was still a pretty mid list author, and I just was so happy. I was so happy to you know, make my tiny little sum of money to be able to tell stories. And then the Newberry, of course, is just, it's, it's just hard to comprehend. And I, so, so I think that line was speaking to the, my inability to comprehend where I was standing at that moment. 
I want to drill down, if we can, on this idea of creating a place in literature for readers, for all walks of life, to see people like themselves represented. Sure. There's a poignant moment in Last Stop on Market Street when CJ, the protagonist and young African-American boy, and his grandmother get off the bus in what the artwork implies is an economically challenged urban neighborhood. Yeah. And CJ asks his grandmother, how come it's always so dirty over here? And she responds, sometimes when you're surrounded by dirt, CJ, you're a better witness for what's beautiful. Can you talk about what you understand CJ's grandma to mean? So I just think sometimes when you're an outsider or marginalized in some way, I think you actually have a more clear understanding of the world. And, you know, and, and in this case, more specifically, America. And I think writers who are on the outside and, you know, I feel like I've, I've kind of always been on the outside as a writer for a minute, especially after the Newberry. It, it felt like I was a, on the inside, but I think, I think it's been reestablished that I'm more of an outsider type of writer um, in the past year. You know, I, I think she's just saying you can see clearly when you stand where we stand right now. And, and I really do believe that. I think the best writers are just reporters from the fringes. You know, some people use the word woke, which I don't really like that word. I think it's kind of silly. Why do you think it's silly? It just, it, it was, you know, to be honest, it's kind of like a w word that go, got co-opted by white America. It kind of reminds me, just using the word, it kind of reminds me of that phenomena of like the safety pin. It's just one of those things where I go back to the... Uh, this basketball line, like, don't talk about it, be about it. Um, so sometimes I feel like those gestures are nothing but gestures, and it's really about what you do. But the concept does make sense to me in that, you know, like, you can go through the world truly seeing, or you can go through the world seeking comfort. And I think, uh, when you are in discomfort, you know, and, and even if in that scene in Last Stop, there is a bit of discomfort because it's a different neighborhood. Um, CJ doesn't know every every uh, alley, doesn't know every piece of graffiti. This is new. But from that discomfort, you can be more clear-headed. And, you know, I've been reading some Buddhist stuff uh, the past few months and and I, for a while, I thought, oh my gosh, this is kind of like a new idea. Like this is, this is novel. And then I read a, a lot of Buddhist stuff, and I was like, oh gosh, this isn't new at all. It's just called Buddhism. <laughs> you've said in other interviews that you've given that as an artist, your interest in writing about people from working class backgrounds, yeah, and capturing moments of grace and dignity in their lives, yeah. What draws you as an artist to write about working class people? I don't even think. Okay, so. I have this theory that I don't even know if I'm making anything up. I feel like I'm just reporting. And sometimes I'll say that I'm, I'm like plagiarizing the world because I'm not, I'm not creating stories. I'm just reporting stories. And so when I grew up, you know, I would kind of uh, watch my surroundings. You know, I grew up in a, in a very working class, poor community. And then we moved um, for high school. We moved to a more kind of middle class neighborhood and and I never felt quite like I was a part of it but it was it was a great vantage point cuz I could really study it from somebody who who felt like they didn't really fit in there you know little things like this you know I, I went from a community where nobody had anything and now I was in a place where some people had a little bit of a little padding and I remember one of my good friends he was on the basketball team. He would go to Burger King every lunch period because we had open campus lunch and he'd get two Whoppers and he'd eat one and a half of them. And then he'd always offer me, because I had no money and couldn't afford anything, he'd offer me the second half, you know, the half eaten second burger. And I remember I would like just, you know, punch it with my fist because I'd be like, you're not giving me your leftovers. So I, I just think, I feel like traditionally books would be written with him in mind, and I wanted to write from the perspective of the kid who was unwilling to accept the leftovers. 
reading your books, and I've seen you you speak a number of times, and there there is a, an, an autobiographical influence in them. Yeah. Just as class is integral to your stories, race is also. And in the books that you wrote, especially earlier in your career, your characters often tended to struggle with questions about their racial identity. Yeah. In Mexican White Boy, Danny Lopez, the protagonist, is said to be, and I'm quoting your book here, a shade darker than all the white kids at his private high school, Lucadia Prep. But whenever Danny comes down to National City, where his dad grew up, where all his aunts and uncles and cousins still live, he feels pale, a full shade lighter. And we were here, Miguel recalls his Mexican grandfather, who is a migrant worker and picked produce on farms in California, telling him and his brother that, and I'm quoting again, we might be dark on the outside, but inside we were white like a couple blonde boys from Hollywood. Yeah. Can you talk about your interest in exploring race and racial identity in your stories? Absolutely. So I think um, <laughs> I think when I, when I hear those quotes, it's just, I'm just laughing because that's just me trying to figure out what I believe and me trying to figure out my own experiences. You know, there's this concept out there where writers should write what they know. And I totally would amend that to say that writers should, under the umbrella of writing what you know, most writers are exploring what they don't understand. And when I was young, there were no books about growing up mixed. If there were, I certainly never saw them. They were never introduced in, in a school setting. So, you know, who do you go, if you're biracial, who do you, who do you ask about that, that experience? You don't go to your dad, because in my case, my dad was full Mexican. You don't go to your mom, she's full white. So you're doing something, experiencing something new in the family line. And you're kind of on your own to navigate it in a weird way, kind of in a lonely context. So when I'm writing those books, I'm really just kind of exploring the things that I didn't understand as a young guy. You know, there was, there was a short story I wrote in grad school. It ended up being a part of Mexican White Boy, but it was called um, Along for the Ride. And, and this was the first time I really dug into what it meant to be mixed, what it meant to you know, be closer to the majority to be able to pass physically. And, and in a way, not even, it, it, not even having to deal with some of the true pitfalls of being non-white in America because you could pass, but feeling tremendous guilt for that ability to pass because you look at the rest of your family and they can't pass. And they're dealing with you know, the, the, the tougher stuff. So it, it's a weird place to be when you're a mixed kid in a working class community because you're kind of the chosen one because you're lighter. And yet because of the guilt that you feel that you associate with that, that status within the family, you are even further removed from who you want to be. So it's a weird you know, you're, you're when you're surrounded by dirt, you know what I mean? Um, also, you know, some people talk a little bit about who their audience is. And all my books, everything I've ever written, I'm really writing for me. I'm writing books that I think I would be interested in now, but even more importantly, when I was young. So I'm writing for that 15-year-old, 17-year-old version of myself. That actually is a perfect bridge for a question I wanted to ask you. Anybody who knows me knows that I would be uh, totally remiss if I didn't get you to talk about We Were Here, because honestly, I think it's one of the most impressive young adult novels that I've ever read. Oh, thank you. I really do. Not only is it beautifully written, but it grapples with deeply, deeply philosophical questions. And those are the books that really resonate with me as a reader. For listeners who aren't familiar with the novel, it's the story of three teenage boys, one Mexican-American, one Asian, and one black, who run away from a group home for juvenile offenders and head for Mexico where they hope to begin new lives. Throughout the story, Miguel grapples with what I'd argue are fundamentally existential questions like, why is there suffering and what's the meaning of my life? But he also wrestles with what he calls the imaginary lines. Yes. The divide people. So class lines, color lines, lines that demarcate national borders. 
And there's a scene in the book where Miguel finds himself on the border, looking through a fence into Mexico, and another teenage boy, and he thinks to himself, why was he on the Mexico side of the fence, and I was on the American side? How did it happen like this? If our country's really so much better than Mexico, like everybody says, because we got more money, and better schools, and better hospitals, and less people get sick just by drinking the water, then why should I be here and not him? Why was I on the better side of this big-ass fence? Just because my mom is white? Because of the story my pop told me about how Gramps snuck through a sewage drain, crawled in everybody's piss and shit just to make it to America? But that's nothing to do with me. What did I do? And what did this kid selling Clay Sons not do? Can you talk about what you were trying to accomplish with that scene as a writer? That's my favorite book I've written. And it's just because I didn't try to write a book. I just let the character go on a, on a little journey physically, but also uh, intellectually. And I just followed him. And one of the biggest things is this idea of a border. I grew up right next to the border and we would cross into Mexico all the time. And it really fascinated me how I would be considered poor in America the minute we crossed the border and we were in my grandfather's neighborhood, they would call me the rich boy. And I didn't understand, like, how could you just drive three miles and your label is so different um, from a different community? So um, I wanted to explore those kinds of things. And yeah, this idea of lines. Now, we have so much discourse right now about immigration. And, and you know, there does probably need to be a better immigration policy, okay? I am not savvy enough to know what it is, but I do know how to look at the situation empathetically. And if you look at these kids separated from families, you know, I have a four-year-old daughter. What, what right does she have to live in such comfortable circumstances going to a private school than the kid being taken away from his mom at the border? Like, that doesn't square if you just look at it with an empathetic heart. It all, it all kind of goes back to this theory I have, which is that every person is looking unconsciously for a way to be better than another person. I just think that's what the human condition leads us to. It used to be religion, like I'm more pious than you, therefore I'm better. But it could also be country. You know, I live in America, therefore I'm better than you. I have more money and a bigger house and a better car, therefore I'm better than you. And you know, if you want to look in the writing world, I have such and such sales, therefore I'm better than you. And nobody's using in their minds that gross language. I love ta Coates uses this phrase, the elegant racist. So, you know, somebody who's not using racial slurs out loud but is inside sneakily thinking racist thoughts. Not like we should have segregated water fountains, but, oh, I deserve this opportunity because of who I am. You understand what I'm saying? So Absolutely. those lines are fascinating. And it all comes to me back to this idea of we're always looking for a way to be better than somebody else. So if you are on the north side of the border, you have more opportunities and potential for a better life than if you are on the southern part of the border. Now, these are deep thoughts that most people don't want to think about, especially if you're on the northern side of the border, because it's uncomfortable. But Miguel, who's stripped of his privilege because he, he had to go to, uh, and let me just back up and say he didn't have monetary privilege, but he had American privilege. He's stripped of that because he committed a crime. So now he's naked, um, in a way, at the northern part of the border, looking at a kid on the other side. And in that moment of desperation where he has nothing, he's been stripped, he doesn't have his mother's love anymore, she won't look at him, I feel like, again, kind of cross-referencing that line that you brought up earlier from Last Up on Market Street, he's in the dirt, and he has a better vantage point in which to study this kid on the other side. So he goes there and says, you know, what did I do to deserve this? What did he not do? 
And so to me, that's fascinating. Now, I don't have answers because I think a good novel doesn't um, provide answers. I think a good novel just asks interesting questions. As you're talking and I'm thinking about that scene, it really captures the arbitrariness yeah. of what you're describing as well. There's a moment where Miguel's thinking, how did this fence even come to be here? Like these guys met at some point in time and they decided it's going to run right here. And they could have decided it's going to run a little further north. Or they could have decided it's going to run a little further south. And that would have tremendous consequences for the people who lived in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And that speaks to the absurdity of everything. Like one of my favorite novels is Catch-22. And, you know, the whole novel is just about the absurdity of everything because it's all man-made, you know? Everything that's man-made is slightly absurd. Well, I've always assumed that it's not uh, just a coincidence that Miguel is backpacking to Mexico. One of the books that he has in his backpack is Camus the Stranger. Yeah, totally. Because that goes back to the existential thing, you know? I, I love all Camus books, but that one in particular is kind of, it can hit you when you're young. Yeah. And I, and, and I just think, to me, I, I swear, how could a novel not have elements of existentialism? Because that's the human condition. You know, you have to grapple with existentialism. You just have to. I don't want to overstep boundaries here or psychoanalyze you. Yeah. Every time that I read We Were Here and I reach that scene that we were just talking about, I can't help but feel like it's you, Matt Del Pena, who's grappling with the feelings of guilt that Miguel experiences in the novel. In other words, he's just a vehicle that you're using to process your own feelings of guilt. Oh, yeah. Is that fair? Oh, I think that's very fair. I think even when a, even when you write something that is further from your own circumstances, I think you're, I think you are using it as almost a set to explore things that you you're you're grappling with yourself yeah i remember i read this quote from uh murakami and he said when your dog dies do not write about your dog dying but you take that feeling and you put it somewhere else and you're exploring the pain that you feel you know what i mean so i i think that that's pretty true and so yeah that that's thing i will tell you that the title of the book it came down to we were here or sons of clay those were my two finalists for the title and unfortunately i don't love the title sons of clay on its own if you just look at the title but that's how important that scene was to me I, to me that's the whole book he makes the decision that he has to face up to the consequences he's been given and actually in a way he's doing it because he was lucky enough to be on the north side I want to switch directions here, especially because we've been talking about your own biography intersects with your writing. Yeah. And my research team, which is me, <laughs> in, in trying to uh, learn uh, more about you, found myself going back in your Twitter feed because I remembered a little more than a year ago. It's 2017. It was shortly after Disney Pixar released its film Coco. And you took your daughter to see it. And afterwards, you tweeted we went to see Coco as a family last weekend. And as we were leaving the theater, I whispered in my daughter's ear, that was your story too, baby, on your Mexican side. I felt so proud to tell her that. Yep. Can you talk about what it meant to you to share that film with your daughter? Well, first of all, how cool is it that Mexican fathers and even, you know, half Mexican fathers like me all across the country were saying that to their kids. Like that is the power of, diversity in art. Um, so yeah, I think Luna, my daughter, she's so removed from how I grew up. And, you know, she's more Chinese than Mexican or white. But there are little moments that I get to share with her and say, hey, you're part of that too. Mostly it's books that I read, you know, that I'm always looking for. But also, you know, here was a major, major motion picture that made so much money and it, it was set in Mexico and it featured a Mexican child. And it, I just felt, it, it almost reminded me to remind her who she is. Because I think sometimes we, we spend so much time just getting through the day by day. And, and my main focus is reading to her, you know, choosing diverse books, obviously, but reading to her, 
um, helping her learn how to make the arms on a body and not just the head um, that, you know, you sometimes don't take that step back and look at the other things you're guiding your children through, which is, you know, racial pride, um, things like that. And, and that was a rare moment where it made me take a step back and I felt so good about it. And I was watching all the kids love the movie around me and all the parents fight tears. And I was like, you know, this is part of you too. You're a part of this. You aren't just watching this. It's telling you a little bit about a part of who you are. Kind of comes back to Dennis Johnson's line that you opened your Newberry speech with. I'd never known, never even imagined for a heartbeat, there might be a place for people like us. Yeah, totally. And especially in Hollywood. You mentioned reading diverse books with your uh, daughter. You've been a spokesperson for the We Need Diverse Books campaign, which is a nonprofit organization that aims to support diversity in children's literature and publishing. I wonder if you could share your thoughts about the need for that organization. Well, I just think uh, Ellen O, who started it, is she's just a force. And, you know, there have been many conversations through the years about the importance of having diverse options for readers. So, you know, it's it's problematic if the default story is middle class and white. You know, you want other options. And one of the things I was always saying early on is like, hey, we're not saying instead of, we're saying also, which is true. But the the I guess the longer I'm in this writing world, the more I realize, okay, well, maybe that was a bit of a nice kind of sentiment or position. Maybe at times there does need to be some people saying, hey, it should be instead of, at least right now. And then, and then there will be a correction. So I love the the We Need Diverse Books movement um, because, yeah, there's a fight to get more diversity in literature, diversity in protagonists, but they're also doing something quietly, which I think is just as important, which is they're supporting diverse candidates to work inside of publishing because here here's the thing if you know let's say i was a brand new writer and i wrote a book called carmela full of wishes about a girl who is living in a mixed status family with a dad who's been deported you know if it goes to the editors of the 1980s they are 100 percent white and the desire to publish it would be hey this is a voice we don't have on our list. It would be nice to have that on our list. Now, fast forward to 2018, let's say it comes across the desk of a, of a woman who is Mexican or part Mexican, and she reads it and she's moved by it. Then it's not just a book on the list, but it's a passion project, and it becomes a more important list for the publisher. So I think if we can diversify the insides of publishing, by nature, you're going to diversify the books that land in libraries and bookstores. So I, I think it's just an incredibly important movement. And I'm just proud. I'm proud to have like a small part in it. When you look at the landscape of children's publishing today, how impactful would you say the call for more diverse children's books has been? I think it's pretty tremendous. I, I think there's a long way to go. But I do think it's pretty tremendous. And and I would say in the past three years, there's been a major change. I, I do think it's interesting that, that sometimes um, there are forgotten sections of diversity. Like our native material is just so lacking still. So I think that is still a blind spot. And also we aren't, we aren't looking at I, – I call them the unspoken diversities, which to me class – is an unspoken diversity, which is just as important as race, um, but also emotional diversity, uh, adversity inside the house. There, there are so many unspoken things for kids that they're dealing with, like divorce or substance abuse or incarceration. And I think those are things that can be explored too. So there's always going to be more stories that, that need to be advocated for. But I think in terms of a first step, I think the racial element is is starting to change. With the room for growth. Yes, yes. Let's switch gears here. So you published Ball Don't Lie in 2005. Yeah. 
10 years later, you wrote The Last Stop on Market Street. What motivated you to try your hand at writing a picture book for children? Well, that was my agent. <laughs> Cause I, I, really? Yeah, I have an a- agent named Stephen Malk, part of Writer's House. And when I, I had written two novels, and we started to work together. And I remember he would email me occasionally and say, hey, would you ever consider writing a picture book? And I was like, oh, probably not. Like, I'm not that interested in that. If anything, if I'm going to get out of YA, I'll probably just do an adult novel. And he goes, okay. And then he would ask me again. And then, um, unbeknownst to me, he had pulled parts of Bald Don't Lie out of the book, put them into a more picture book sort of format, and sent them to a couple editors and said, do you think that he has the voice that would be pretty good with picture books? And a few of them were like, yeah, that we'd be interested. And he's, he again would say, hey, just so you know this happened, I'd be like, okay, well, maybe in the future. And then he gave me this opportunity to work with Kadir Nelson on a book called uh, A Nation's Hope, which is a story about Joe Lewis. Lewis. And I was like, okay, well, I love this guy's art. Let me try this. And so, you know, I started working on, on that book. And what I realized is that it wasn't, it wasn't, um, a switch in mindset for me. It was almost like going home. Uh, because I started out writing poetry and I realized, oh my gosh, you can approach writing a picture book like writing poetry. So that's what I did with that book. And I, it felt very natural. And I also liked that I was writing about kind of big things like race and sport and, and history. So from that point on, I was like, hey, Steve, I'm in. I'll, I'll do picture books, definitely. Like if you if you have any thoughts, anything you want me to explore, or any artist that you think I'd be interested in working with, you know, let's do it. So from that point on, I started seeking picture book ideas. And so with Last Up on Market Street, uh, Steve had a brand new illustrator. His name was Christian Robinson. And I was like, okay, well, this will be the first time I ever do fiction uh, for a picture book. Let's try it. And it just like, writing the poetry and planting these kind of like big, big themes, but they're kind of in the margins. Um, It really appealed to me. So the way I look at it, it's not an exploration of big ticket items when it's in a picture book, but it's an introduction to big ticket items. So it may not hit with a child, you know, like in Last of a Market Street, when they're getting on the bus, the grandmother guides CJ to the front seat of the bus. You know, this is a direct call out of the, of the civil rights movement, but most kids are never going to get there unless they're reading the book with somebody who wants to go there. So it, it kind of forms an introduction to an idea as more than an exploration of the idea. So the text just reads, they sat right up front. And that's all it says. But if you want to really look at that line, which to me is a very important um, character detail for the for the grandmother, then you can go there and you can like leave the book for 30 minutes exploring that, you know, so I kind of like that. And then what I love about working with Christian Robinson is my texts, they tend to be a little bit heavy. And on their own, I don't think they're great children's books. But when Christian comes in and his illustrations are so whimsical, he kind of undercuts some of my heavy and he makes it for children. And I think that collaborative, um, accidental approach really is nice. But Christian also illustrated Carmel Full of Wishes. He did. And you've partnered with Lauren Long. Yeah. He's just a tremendous artist. Oh, yeah. And he worked on Love and Anna Ramirez, who did the artwork for Miguel and the Grand Harmony. Yeah. I'm curious, how do you approach collaborating with another creator on a project? What does that relationship entail? Can you walk me through it? Sure. So it really depends on the illustrator, because one of the most important things you have to do when you're writing a picture book is you have to honor the collaborative element that that's kind of at work. So a potential pitfall as a writer is to try to take ownership of the story and to try to see the visual of the story. And guess what? That's not your, you got, you got to stay in your lane. You know what I mean? Um, If you're lucky enough to work with 
an incredibly talented illustrator, which I feel incredibly fortunate to have worked with some some amazing people. You know, you have to really honor who they are, how they want to work, and let them be the guide. You've done the text. You have the music. And now they get to play it. That's the way I look at it. And however it comes out, it comes out. With Christian, he likes to go into the basement, um, his office, and he does the work. And occasionally I'll get a text from him with a question or a thought. But mostly he's working on his own. He'll work with the art director. But I'm out of the loop and I just get sketches and I see the art come in. With Lauren, I think it was because love was such a... um, a difficult text to illustrate because it's it's not as concrete. There's not one main character. The way I describe it is the main character is a contemporary, I should say, a collective contemporary American childhood. So now we have multiple characters and it's kind of an abstract poem. This was a little bit more difficult and Lauren wanted to really kind of talk through the text. So we... We sat down at an NCTE for, I want to say, five hours. I believe bourbon was involved. And we just, we talked through the whole book. And we talked mostly around the book and outside of the book. But we were really just talking about what does this mean? What do we want to give readers here? What are we, what are we really exploring with a book called Love that has kind of some, some sad moments and some adversity? And and what we ended up doing is we talked a lot about our lives and how I was from a border town in San Diego. He was from the Midwest, Kentucky, and then Missouri, and then now Cincinnati. And um, we just talked about our lives and how we were very different in many ways, uh, geographically and racially, but we both had families that valued the concept of love. And, And so we just really kind of put our lives into the story. And um, it, w- it was one of my favorite moments of my career was that conversation because we got really deep. You know, we're talking like 600 words and we were getting really, really deep with it. And then, of course, I was never prescriptive about the actual images. The one note I said is when there is a face in the mirror, and it, you know, I see it as kind of big. I just feel like that—that that has to be a brown kid. And you know, immediately he was like, "Of course, it has to be." So that was the only moment where we actually talked about actual illustrations. Um, but yeah, so getting back to your question, it really depends on the artist, and I think the writer has to approach it with humility and let the illustrator guide the collaboration. Is that hard for you? You know, because I think of the myth of the auteur, yeah. right? the individual artist crafting yeah. this project, you know, when, when we think of a, a novel, which is a myth because you write a novel and, and I would imagine editors and reviewers sure. have, have their hands on it. But was it hard for you to let go of the control? You know what? This, this probably uh, could be surprising, but not at all. Like, I never, like, I don't have an image in my head of what the illustrator should do. Um in fact, I recently found out that the majority of t- uh, picture book writers, they will actually break the text down into different page numbers. So they'll they'll say on page one to two, it should be this text. All I've ever done is just turn in a poem. So I don't think I'm even thinking through the pages. To me, I just love words and I love playing with sounds so much that I'm more concentrated on the rhythm and the music of the text than what the ultimate image should be that goes with it. So it's really not hard. Maybe it helps to work with really great people, but I just trust them to do their thing. And and the best illustrators, they don't just echo what the text says. They kind of tell a story that weaves in and out of the text that's slightly different. I read Love. Oh, cool. Went to my local Barnes and Noble, and I went over to uh, one of those little benches they have in the back of the yeah. store, right? And I read it. I'm telling you, there were moments in the middle of that book when I was just teary. 
And I'm looking around, you know, to look at the middle-aged guy who's getting teary over the children's <laughs> picture book. But it's just a beautiful ode to love and the many forms that it takes in a person's life. And I rushed home and I started looking up interviews you'd done where you talked about that book. And you said that you wrote it in part due to your feeling overwhelmed by the divisiveness in our country. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Sure. I mean, to be more candid, you know, the the political discourse was was hard for me because I was kind of a new parent and it just seemed like everybody was yelling at everybody else and um, you know the right was slinging mud and the left was slinging mud back and you know it's funny because during the election when we were getting really close to it everybody in New York of course is like oh well Hillary's gonna kill in this it's gonna it's not a it's it's a blowout but then I would I would sometimes like have events in the Midwest quiet towns like small towns in the Midwest and I would I like to rent a car cuz I'll probably never be in that part of town again so I want to drive through and just check it out and all I saw were Trump signs so I was like I don't know what you guys are talking about but uh I've seen different parts of this country and so anyways the point is I was trying to process all that while at the same time having these interesting conversations with a three-year-old daughter who was so naive to it all and so innocent and I wanted to protect her. And so I, at, at first I said, you know what, I'm just going to write a poem. It's going to be 100% reinforcing and positive and even sentimental. I'm going for it. And it's going to be for my daughter. So I kind of wrote it for her. But then when I was reading the first, you know, 20 or 25 drafts of it, I was like, why am I embarrassed of this? Why does it feel not true? And what I realized is if you are going to write about love, if you're going to write a poem about love, if you don't acknowledge the role adversity plays in love, then you are not even scratching the surface of the concept. So I had to, I had to really dig deep and go to sadness. Um, it's kind of the yin and the yang thing. If you want to know light, you must also know dark. I think the same is true about happiness. If you, if you really want to have moments of happiness, well, you better know sadness. Um, and I think when I started to write love, I, I wanted to explore that sort of concept. And so it changed the poem. And then Lauren and I were sitting there and, and he was like, do you think we can even do this in a picture book? And I was like, I don't know, but let's just try. Um, and I will tell you, like it was before the book came out, it was definitely a question whether or not it could be marketable because there were moments that were pretty dark and pretty heavy. But uh, this is just what we wanted to explore. Well, you published an essay almost exactly a year ago yeah. in Time Magazine, and it was titled Why We Shouldn't Shield Children from Darkness. And in it, you grapple with a number of questions, and two of them are, how honest should authors who write for children be with our readers, and is the job of the writer for the very young to tell the truth or preserve innocence? How do you answer that question for yourself? Yeah, so I really answered that question in the process of writing love, because what I realized is I said, in order to make the best book, I have to lean toward truth. So nothing's black and white, of course. So you're not going to choose one or the other. You're going to find your shade of gray. And for me, I ended up leaning a little bit toward the truth. Um, so here we have a moment where a young girl comes down the steps. She sees that her family is gathered around the TV. She makes a move to join them, but the grandmother keeps her there. I feel like that is my answer. We don't show what's on the TV. We don't show you that for the illustrator it was 9-11, for me it was DACA. But we bring you close to that gathered family. But she has to remain a little bit on the outside. And doesn't see exactly what's on the TV. I think that's what my picture book strives to do there. 
is bring them to that loss of innocence, but not facilitate it. This is a huge question, and okay. answer as you can. I'm nervous. I'm opinion. nervous. This might be hard. <laughs> In your opinion, what is the role of a writer? Or maybe better, what is the role of an artist? in uncertain times like the ones that we find ourselves living in today? Mm, okay. Um, I think it depends on who the artist is because I think it's important for me to, to back up and say all the stuff I just said about exploring love in, in a poem and a picture book is just my uh, aesthetic. That's what I'm trying to do. But there are some genius writers out there who can write about love and keep it purely positive, purely reinforcing, and produce something wonderful. So to answer your question, I would say it depends on who the artist is and what their sensibility is. Um, so I could answer it from my point of view, uh, which is this. I think writing for children can be an activism. When I first wrote Bald Don't Lie, Mexican White Boy, we were here, I didn't think about activism. I just was trying to explore things I was confused about. As I move a little bit deeper into the stuff I'm writing, I start to get to go to school, get to read Last Stop on Market Street to an underprivileged school one day and a private school the next day. And I get to see how different readers are taking it in and I start to see how my words um, sit in the world, depending on you know the audience. So now I'm I think I'm a little more savvy about what books are. And so for my answer to your question, it would be it would be this: I don't think any writer should go into a book with a message. That's called bad writing. If you want to go in with a message, write an essay. But I do think a writer should come into a book with a point of view. And it's the point of view that is probably in all your work. So for me, what is it? It's diverse characters. It's working class situations. And it's kind of hitting on deeper subjects for younger kids if I'm writing a picture book. And not really striving for for the you know the commercial success when I write way I'm just trying to write quiet stories about kids you know uh, that aren't in the circumstances that are normally written about in YA I, I love that you said in a way you're an activist writer and I applaud that and I'm with you and I'm when I was thinking about that question I was specifically thinking of authors who I could envision that being the last thing that they would say or their publisher saying to them, that's the last thing we want you to say because you're talking about a commercial industry. Yes, yes. And I imagine that there are a lot of writers, especially for young adults or for children, because we write or wrong, we, we shelter that audience so much. So I can imagine there's a lot of writers who say or think, I can't be political yeah. Yeah. because it's, it's going to hurt me in the marketplace, right? So how do you balance your desire to make art and tell truth with the reality that you're working in this profit-driven industry. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> I don't know. The first thing that comes to mind is, before I got married, um, I sat my wife down and I said, "You, ha I have to tell you something and you have to make a decision. And she's like, okay, this sounds kind of like heavy. And I was like, well, I just want you to know I'm never going to make money. And... I just want you to know that before, because I think I had two books at the time and they were, you know, not selling crazy <clears throat> amounts. That was just kind of mid-list YA. And I was like, I'm never going to make money and I'm not going to try. <laughs> or, or, or not that I'm not going to not try, but I, I'm. this is the stuff I'm always going to probably write about. And I thought it was going to be this beautiful moment where she was going to be like, I don't care about money. But she actually said, Hmm, I got to think about this. <laughs> and I was like, what? But but I think I never saw the writing job as a vehicle toward to to money. And but I also never saw it as as a vehicle to writing important books. 
I I honestly just think I always saw it as like this thing I love to do and these conversations I love to explore or or subjects I want to just put out there into the world or characters I just love and you should check this character out like this this life he's living is is kind of cool it might not be perfect he might not be comfortable all the time but it's interesting check it out so I think uh, again I'll go back to your beginning line that you quoted from Dennis Johnson it's like I was never supposed to be in this world anyway so I'm just gonna explore the stories that are interesting to me and if if it doesn't work out for some reason or they tell me you're you know you're done your books aren't aren't working anymore then I'll just go do landscaping like my uncles <laughs> you know what I mean like I just feel like every book is kind of a miracle so if it if that's true I can't really think about the sales part of it I just have to do what what interests me like if I write a book that I wouldn't read then that's when I think I'm messing up and then one other thing I, I will tell you that came to mind um, on the subject is I don't know like if you if you're writing to sell copies I think readers smell a rat um, in a weird way, you're better off, you're going to appeal to, to a wider audience if you're more specific. And that seems counterintuitive. Like, it seems like the best way to, <clears throat> to appeal to a wide audience is to write something that's general. But the truth is, it's going to, to appeal to a wider audience if you're more specific. So not only are you you're in a poor community, you're in a poor community in California, but not only California, right by the border, and not even just right by the border, you're on Potomac Street. The reason why I think that that appeals to a wider, wider audience is because it's a more clear window into a different life as opposed to a, a, a kind of a foggy picture. So if you are going to be more specific, you run the risk of being less commercial, but you also are closer to something clear. When you reflect on the body of your work, what do you understand yourself to be trying to accomplish as a writer? It's, it's funny. I think, I think the thing that excites me most is revising. A, <laughs> this, this is like silly because it's not grandiose at all, but it, what comes to mind is, is looking at a line revising it over and over and over and over and over. And then on like the 50th try, you you find a word that links the sentence and you read it to yourself and you go, oh my God, I found it. I found the music of that sentence. And that's a very silly minor thing, but I think all I'm trying to do is continually trying to find that that aha moment of of a sentence and it has nothing to do with readers and it has nothing to do even with characters i just love attempting to find it, it's like you're oh, you're turning rocks over you know looking for that diamond you're keep continually like lifting rocks and looking under it and you can't find it and when you find it you're like this is what I want to do all my life is, you know, every once in a while you find it. I remember in Last Stop on Market Street, riding a line, CJ's chest grew full and he was lost in the sound and the sound gave him the feeling of magic. And I didn't know what that line was. It just, there wasn't something, something wasn't right about it for so long. And then when I put in the repetition of the word sound, it came alive for me. And that's my favorite thing about writing. Writing is almost a form of meditation for you, it sounds like. It's the place you go. Like, I get the impression from talking to you that if you weren't selling a lot of books, you'd still be writing. 
Honestly, it sounds like a very cathartic experience for you. Yeah, 100%. It's like, it's my favorite place to be. And every writer knows that the majority of your time is frustrating. But there are these little glimpses of like, just euphoria. And it's almost like, because you know I got to do this, Sean. I got to take it back to sports. But, you know, you're playing a pickup game and you're 15 and you're in over your head. Like you're playing with older guys and they're better than you. And you're just trying to survive most of the time. But every once in a while, this one day, in this one hour, you kind of get into the zone and you kind of can't miss a shot. And you're watching the people around you after you nail that third shot from the wing look at you differently. And it's euphoria. It's not just about the ball going into the basket. It's about the world seeing your story differently and... I think that's like you have you have glimpses of that in writing just like you do when you're 15 and you're playing at Muni Gym in Balboa Park. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt, for taking time to talk with me. Time out of your holiday and time away from your family on a weekend. It's been amazing. 100%, Sean. I loved when I visited your school way back. And, and uh, yeah, so whenever you want to talk, I'm here. And that's our show for this month. If you did like what you heard, please do tell a friend about us. In the meantime, I look forward to seeing you back here next month when we'll continue to celebrate the craft of storytelling.